question often raised by motivational speakers, you've probably heard the question, what would you do if you knew you could not fail? I believe the intent of a question like that is if you took fear out of the equation, what would you do? Because fear often factors in. I'm afraid of what might happen if I stepped out and, and did that. I was thinking of a slightly different question recently. What could we be about as a body of believers that could not possibly be wrong? And I think there's a, a similar thought behind that kind of question. If you took away any possibility of doubt and fear and failure, knowing that what you're doing is the right thing, what could you possibly be about that could not possibly be wrong? So what are overwhelmingly crystal clear right priorities? Again, what is so right that it could not possibly be wrong? like us to think about those things this morning and address those questions because those questions in particular have come to my mind in light of some recent comments and discussion about a need that we have as a body of believers for clear vision to guide us into the future. And an interesting part of the backdrop of that is, as many of you know, we've been blessed in recent months with some financial resources that provide us with some unique opportunities. That's a tremendous blessing. We're immensely thankful for that. But what's become apparent in the midst of it is unless we have a clear vision, we won't know what to do with what we've been entrusted with. And so uh, in an interesting way, those resources have forced our hand in a good way to come back and say, who are we and what are we and what are we supposed to be about? You've also heard the saying, if you aim at nothing, you're bound to hit it. Better to find a something to aim at than to aim at nothing at all. I think the Apostle Paul was a man with purpose, with direction. I think especially of what he said in 1 Corinthians 9, verse 26. He says, I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way as not beating the air. A man with aim and purpose and direction. Clear guiding purpose is absolutely vital for individuals and for groups. So as I think about vision, as I think about direction that we as a body of believers need, several thoughts to preface the idea and the need for vision. I think first of all it's important to come back to the fact that this group of believers, the church, is ultimately the church of Jesus Christ. Very easy for us to have a sense of ownership, and that's good, but nevertheless, it is His church. You know as well as I do the famous words spoken by Jesus in Matthew chapter 16 in response to Peter's great confession, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. I will build my church. Jesus made it crystal clear that he would be the one who would do the building. There are things that we can do in service. There are things that we can do that can contribute, but we dare never lose sight of the fact it is Jesus who builds his church. So we can never produce results. Again, we can do those things that are helpful for upbuilding and for growth, but it is Jesus who ultimately brings that growth. It is imperative to come alongside of Christ and what he wants to do with his church because anything else will not work in any way, shape, or form. Another thing I'm reminded of as I think about who we are, as I think about our identity, our purpose, our mission, I'm thinking of the fact that whatever it is that we can dream in our heads, whatever we can plan or imagine, will be woefully short of what can be done. I love Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. And we ought to add an amen to that too, right? Amen. And so Paul reminds us 
expand your vision. Stretch the horizons. Of course, whatever you can come up with, whatever you can dream, plan, or think, it doesn't even begin to compare to what the God that we serve can do. So we are encouraged by that. And what He will do with that power that works within us. It is through that power that things are done. Zechariah 4, 6, again a familiar verse. God says, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. You and I can try and we can work, but our efforts are pretty puny compared to what the God of the universe will do through his spirit. And he makes it abundantly clear, what will be done will be through my spirit. Not through rolling up your sleeves and trying really hard because that's going to be inadequate. Try, but try through my spirit. Work with my spirit is my spirit that will accomplish all things. So if Christ is the one who builds his church, and if it is the power of God, his spirit that is the force behind that working in and through our lives, how do we position ourselves to best cooperate with the work and the power of God and his son. Again, what could we be about that could not possibly be wrong? I am convinced that the way that Jesus was building his church at the start was absolutely right. And that is that which could not possibly be wrong. And I think that what he was doing at the start was the timeless blueprint for what he will always want to do. And so again, I go back to the book of Acts. Because the book of Acts chapter 2, in fact, if you're not turned there, open your Bibles to Acts 2 and look again at a passage I know that is familiar, but I want us to look at it in a perhaps more personal way as a body of believers than we have looked at it before, and to consider what does this say about what we ought to be about that could not possibly be wrong. Because again, this is the blueprint. This is how it was at the start. And I'm naive enough to believe the church was on target at least for a little while at the start before it veered off in other directions. If the church is going to be where it needs to be today, it has got to go back and reset at the beginning and follow that blueprint. And so again, I think that what the early church did, especially verses 42 to 47, this is what we can be about that could not possibly be wrong of what Christ was doing with his church then and what he wants to do with it now. Notice carefully, in fact, I, I said 42 to 47, but for a moment I want to back up to verse 41 because the work that he does and he wants to do is through people who are truly his. Because verse 41 says, after that amazing message by Peter on the day of Pentecost, it says, so then those who had received his word were baptized and that day there were added about 3,000 souls. The church at the start was made up of those who had received his word, as it says here, and were baptized. Verse 38, we refer to it often. The things that they had to do to come into the family of God, to become a, a part of the family of God was to repent and be baptized and then to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit lines up very well with what Jesus says in John chapter 3, that we need to be born again of water and the Spirit. And so if you go back to the blueprint, if you go back to the starting point of it all, is it has to be with the people who have made a commitment and who are making a daily commitment to Christ, the head of the church. And again, He's the head, it's His church, and we are the body. And so we don't just once at our baptism come under His authority, but as his people, we are constantly coming under his authority, seeking to listen to his promptings and to faithfully obey because that's where it all starts. One writer says that an unsaved membership devoid of the Holy Spirit has no capacity to overcome self-will, personal agendas, and the love of sin. Only believers who have divine power to put those things off and so manifest the Spirit of God. That is the starting point. The people of God who are saying, I want to live under His authority. Christ is building His church, but He will build His church uh, only through those that are born again and Spirit living as people. So, starting from there, the essentials 
that people such as that must be committed to. Verse 42 talks about the early church being continually devoted. Continually devoted. The word devoted means steadfastness, single-mindedness. To me, that sounds like they were a people that had a vision. And so those born-again early believers had a single-minded guiding vision, and we are told several of those aspects of that vision. First of all, what they were devoted to was the apostles' teaching. Many a times I've thought, I sure wish they would just dig up over in the Middle East, over in Israel, dig up a scroll that has clearly all the notes of what the apostles used to teach. And I've come to realize that we have it right in front of us. The record in the book of Acts, Peter's writings, John's writings, Paul's writings, those indeed are the apostles' teaching. When I read that phrase, the apostles' teaching, I believe it is truth that predates tradition. And I like to think that what we are about as a body of believers is that we are a church that desires to fish a little bit deeper in the pond. It's saying that most of Christianity goes back to a system of beliefs that were based on creeds that were developed about 300 and 400 years after the time of Christ. They're, they're fishing on that level. I don't believe that's good enough. I think that as the church, we want to fish deeper. We want to go back down to the origins and again, the book of Acts are those origins. So we want to go back to that original message. We want to be crystal clear about the message that we find in the book of Acts. So I believe that our vision absolutely must involve a single-minded commitment to the original message found in the New Testament in the book of Acts in particular. I think that we need to clearly proclaim it and certainly we need to authentically live it. We got to be about it not only in word but in deed. It is not enough, as I've tried to stress time and time again from this pulpit, it is not enough for it to be intellectual belief and doctrine. It is good to discover those beliefs and doctrines, but if that is it, it is not far enough. That is not fishing deep enough. We've got to passionately pursue living that which we claim that we believe. Again, another writer says that you can't live out what you don't know or understand. That's why Paul instructed Timothy to preach the word, to be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. The writer goes on to say that that time has come. If your church isn't teaching the truth straight from the Bible, how will you recognize error when it comes, and how will you grow? Don't ever allow anyone to stand in the pulpit who isn't committing to lead the congregation through a deep, penetrating study of God's Word, and those words speak personally to me. I know full well, Sunday after Sunday, I have that responsibility. It must be to preach clearly the deep truths of God, get those out there and say, folks, we've got to know this and we've got to live this. And it's got to come straight out of the Bible because anything else is a very, very poor substitute. Very specifically for the Lakeshore congregation, I believe that we need to make a very serious commitment to media and advertising that is message-oriented. To get right down to our adherence to the Apostles' Doctrine, that, I believe, is what we must do. Because there is no other church, as you know, as well as I do, there is no other church in this area that will communicate the message that we embrace. It is our responsibility alone. I dare to think that if we take media and advertising seriously and get that message out, there may be other congregations that will come alongside and be sister congregation in the truest sense of the word and say, we believe those truths and we embrace them and we want to partner, we want to live with you in those things. But for now... It is our responsibility alone to get out a message that none other will. As such, I believe that we need to seriously and deliberately discuss and plan for wise and effective use of modern media that will communicate that vital message. That requires, I think, the best of our efforts. To sit down and really seriously pray, think, and plan and say how can we use resources and most effectively use media to get that word out. That has got to be part I believe, of our vision. It is said that good eye vision is 2020. 
Good vision ought to be 2020. Acts chapter 20, verse 20 is good vision because the Apostle Paul said, I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you publicly and from house to house. That's good vision. That's the kind of vision Lakeshore needs. That we would not shrink back from declaring anything profitable in public in a setting like this, but also from house to house. And I think that fits well with verse 42 and another priority that I see there. They were continually devoting themselves to fellowship. Fellowship was a high priority with the early church. A lot of detail about the kind of fellowship they had. I don't think their fellowship necessarily involved going and having a meal together in their social hall or their fellowship hall. Uh, it was more than that. Nothing, nothing wrong with doing that, but it's got to go deeper. It's got to go further than that. Uh, as far as home groups, I've talked about it a lot from this pulpit. I continue to talk about it, that I believe that every member needs to be involved in some form of small group because that's where there's real vitality. If you simply come to Sunday services, that's good, we're glad you're here, but that's not going deep enough either. You've you got to get together in authentic relationship and fellowship with one another because that's where we blossom and grow and that's where good things happen. Because in that kind of a setting, you can talk about things you'll never talk about here on Sunday morning. You can get into issues that you'll never get into otherwise. It's really pretty superficial if it's only a Sunday fellowship. To be like the early church, to be about that that is so right that could not possibly be wrong, we get together in small groups. We find ways to share together. Small groups can take a lot of different forms, but I think homes are the best settings. And I encourage that we take that seriously and that we really get involved more and more in home groups. And again, the goal that every single member and attender be involved in some kind of small group. In a recent open letter that I sent out to you all, I recommended that we set aside funding for special fellowship building events. I do believe those things are important. I think that we need to fund retreats and weekend events, special meetings, those kinds of things where we come together in a concentrated way for renewal and for growth. I believe that those things need to be priorities for us as a body of believers. Verse 42 also says the early church was continually devoted to the breaking of bread. Breaking of bread sounds to me like they had some meals together, but commentators believe it may have meant more than that. That might have been a reference to sharing together in the Lord's Supper. And it's kind of interesting that when the church met together, they were pretty much synonymous from what I read in the New Testament record, it sounds to me like they had meals together that culminated in a remembrance of the Lord's sacrifice. And so much as this might mean as a priority of gathering together to observe the Lord's Supper, I want to share with you a concern I have in how we remember the Lord's Supper. It's an okay thing that we do what we do the first of the month in this room, utilizing emblems at this table. But I wonder if that goes deep enough as far as being committed to what the early church did. Apparently, again, they shared a meal together and they celebrated the Lord's Supper with that. I would suggest that we consider this at least. That to make it a priority to share perhaps once a month a meal together and share communion at the conclusion of that meal together and see if that enhances the meaning of the Lord's Supper, and more in line with what the early church was doing. It's just something on my mind that I throw out for you to consider and to see if that would be helpful and think about it and pray about it and let me know what you think. Verse 42 also says the early church was continually devoted to prayer. Nothing works without the foundation of prayer. We can do all the other things right and leave out prayer and we've done nothing right. That's one thing that is so right it could not possibly be wrong is for God's people to be fervent in prayer individually and as a group. I am so pleased that we have five faithful prayer partners. and We had a number of people involved in that capacity over the years. I'm glad that right now I can tell you there are five people that are praying for every member and family in this church every week. And I'm part of that as well. I want you to know I believe in that. I believe we need to lift each other up in prayer because it is a spiritual battle we face and we need to protect one another in prayer. And I'm glad we have an organized effort to be lifting up people in prayer. But I think that we need to continually be increasing our efforts in the area of prayer. I'm thinking back to when I first came here as your pastor. There was a home prayer group. That's all it was about was prayer. And that group no longer meets. 
but I believe there is a need for at least one more such group to start. And so I think if we're going to go back to doing that which is right that could not be wrong, we need to get a concentrated group for prayer, lifting up the ministry and the people, and fervently praying for what it is that we're about. Acts 2 verses 44 to 45, we've referred to in recent times, it indicates the early church was involved in active benevolence. And what they were doing apparently was more than just responding to needs. They were very proactive in a radical way, in a way I can't imagine. They sold off houses and land and they brought the proceeds to the feet of the apostles to distribute to everyone that had a need. A few weeks ago I suggested something to you specifically about abundant sharing ministry. And I think it's a good place to start where we bring surplus in and we find a room in this building and we bring that surplus and place it there and that we have spiritually minded discerning people who can be aware of the needs within the congregation to distribute to anyone that has need. Again, I believe that is a great priority that we need to address in how to make sure that we're not just trying to address spiritual needs, that's important, yes, but if the early church addressed the physical needs as well, I think that we need to be doing the same thing. So again, I believe we need to be proactive in meeting the needs of others because if those physical needs are unmet, that can hinder spiritual needs as well. So they both go together. So I believe we need to make active benevolence a high priority. Verses 46 and 47 in Acts chapter 2 indicates the early church had a single-minded devotion regarding the temple. And that's kind of an interesting thing because that temple and that practice no longer exists. It's been fulfilled in Christ. But what it says to me when I read those verses is they had a single-minded commitment to worship. And it existed in a different form back then, but they believed that worship was important. Worship can easily become ritual and routine. How do we ensure that when we gather together for worship or in our own personal worship, how do we ensure that through God's Spirit there is vibrancy in meaning in what we do in terms of worship? Again, I believe it needs to be a priority for the Lakeshore congregation to deliberately discuss and plan how to make sure that worship is indeed vibrant and active and alive. Again, what could we be about that is so right that it could not possibly be wrong. Five things out of these verses. A commitment to clearly embracing and proclaiming the original truth. In recent weeks we've talked about it in terms of the essential six. That sounds redundant but I believe it really comes down to those things. Embracing and proclaiming the original truth. A commitment to deliberate authentic interaction. Thirdly, a commitment to active benevolence a commitment to faithful prayer fourthly, and fifthly, a commitment to heartfelt and authentic worship. Now, here are some questions I think we need to grapple with in terms of those priorities. How can we best embrace and proclaim the original truth? How can we truly be more than a Sunday church? How can we best be proactive in identifying and meeting needs? How can we mobilize for concerted prayer? And how can we ensure that worship is more than lip service? I think those are important questions. Questions that we don't just read and put away, but that we come back and grapple with. And I think that we need to grapple with them more than just on a Sunday morning or a Wednesday night. I think that God's people need to set aside time to really work through those issues and questions. I want to propose this to you this morning very specifically. I believe that we need to set aside an initial Saturday morning, and if I can get more specific, from 9 o'clock till noon to start with, on a Saturday in October, and to get even more specific, I'm thinking October the 12th, unless somebody can tell me there's a conflict with that date, I believe that we need to make that a commitment to say we're going to sit down together initially for three hours, and we're going to grapple with those questions and we're going to see what is the Lord's vision for this congregation out of those questions and see if we don't find a clearer purpose and direction and move forward with confidence and knowing we're doing that which is right, that could not possibly be wrong. So I felt it placed on my heart today to share those things with you and to encourage you to be in thought and prayer and in discussion about those things so that we can truly be faithful to everything that our Lord requires of us.